from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, the Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. Okay, welcome everybody. We're back for another episode of uh, Live Science Fiction with Kate and Adam. And uh, it's been a couple of weeks, but uh, for all of you loyal uh, viewers and followers out there, hey, you know what? We're, we're, we're back at it and uh, we're, we're, we're hitting the book, so to speak. So um, with that, I've got uh, Kate and Adam and we're going to do rock, paper, scissors on who actually gets to start off uh, you know, t today's dialogue. So between, between the two of you guys, I'm going to count to three and we'll do rock, paper, scissors and one, two, three, go. Oh, okay. the way. Adam, you're up. Bud. You never go with paper first. No one goes with paper. That's why I do it. <laughs> uh, okay. I have to remember where we left off. Last time, I think um, Caitlin had written a great little bit about uh, these aliens that her character meets and how they communicate through colors, their emotions are constantly on display through kind of the complex patterns of, of emotions. Uh, like an octopus. Like an octopus, there you go. <laughs> or a cuttlefish. So uh, I really like that. So I had some fun with that. I, I've been really kind of plotting out in my head this journey that our character needs to go on, right? So like act one is kind of over. They've kind of had something happen to this person. Now they're you know, going to go through a bit of a journey, kind of an emotional and soulful journey on this planet. So with that, you know, there needs to be struggle. There needs to be a little bit of resistance. Um, you know, it's kind of going to be, it's going to be hard, right? Um, so, yeah, I had some, some fun writing a little bit about this colors. I was thinking about uh, you know, if you communicated with, with color, how complex it might look, right? All your emotions playing all the time. It wouldn't just be like red or blue. It would be this like constantly storm of um, emotions, but everything would be on display, right? Um, anyway, is that what you pictured, Caitlin? Yeah, totally. Like almost like it's pulsating, right? It's never like, ding, your color. <laughs> it's like, this is like this rhythmic pulsing that's constantly flowing over their body in different shades and like like there's a there's a thing there's a study about uh certain people can see larger spectrums of color right and they had this like social media post and it was like how many colors could you see right and most people are sitting around 20 i could count up to 56 different colors which is really interesting so even like they might even be able to see colors we can interpret. It could go that level. But yes, you you nailed it with exactly how I like felt it kind of washing over and it's like a mix, right? Like sometimes you're happy and sad at the same time. What does that look like, right? When you mix those emotions and those colors and how does that like pulsate differently? Yeah. Very cool. I'm just... Um... You're pulling it up. Then you can even like play with the speed, right? Like just if you look at a cuttlefish or like you look at a like an octopus, like sometimes the colors flowing over them really fast and changing really fast, right? When they're agitated or whatever. And so you can even play with the the speed at which the colors and patterns are shifting. Yeah, and I had some fun with so the character tries to introduce himself, right? He says, I'm Quinn, and the, the alien is confused because if you, if you imagine a world where you communicate like that, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's like communicating with like a dog. If they could describe like how they experience the world through scent, right? They wouldn't say, my name is Ralph. They would say, I am he who runs with the wind and gathers the leaves and marks the territory. It would be like this big, long <laughs> thing, right? So same thing with, with, this, this, with, with these if you're going to express yourself in color and emotions, then your identity is this like kind of complex set that can't be reduced to a single word. So there's confusion. 
been trying to say I am this one word. Um, right. Yeah. Dogs sniff each other's butts. These people light up differently. Sure. <laughs> Gives a whole new meaning to express. There you go. Right. Um, <laughs> and I hope that's some fun with, because we really wanted to explore the idea of leadership through strengths. I was like, okay. Um, physically, some of these beings could be like larger and like physically imposing, like the hunters, right? Or the warriors. Others could be, you know, smaller, but like suited to their strengths and the tasks that they have in, in the community. Um, so I had some, I was exploring, kind of going, kind of like waking up well enough to kind of walk and like trying to leave the little hut and then like kind of seeing what else is, where he is and what, what's going on there. And, <gasps> Our stories have finally merged. Yeah. So, and then the next thing I was playing with is because if this character has truly lived likely most of his life in a space station, although it might have simulated the outdoors in an open sky, I know that from a lot of sci fi, if you've spent your life indoors, the thought of being under like an endless sky is, is overwhelming. People have like panic attacks and it's it's daunting. Never mind the effect of gravity on your heart or whatever. But like, um, so I thought, wouldn't that be cool if in addition to, you know, dealing with all this, now he's outside is where he always dreamt about going. It's kind of, we maybe we'll embellish that a little bit more earlier on, but and now he's here and it's too much. He can't handle it. He's got to like do it in pieces. He's got to like peek out and slowly without kind of over having sensory overload. Oh, oh. Fun one. I was watching that guy from this the the space shuttle who does all the like, can you do this in space things? I yeah. think I sent it to you, Adam. Yeah. Um, yeah. We could have one where he's like emotionally goes to cry and all it does is like pool in his eyes, right? Like the guy describes, he's like, I'm gonna show you how this kind of works. <laughs> Essentially, that doesn't tears don't fall anymore. <laughs> yeah, I think that works really well to visually um, portray. Uh, kind of like the sadness of having an emotion in a cold, gravityless space or something. Right. right? That would be a really cool something way to like describe that. the scene. Yeah. So I, I have a question for your, um, it's a more of a challenge for your video crew, right? So time mark, uh, 11 minutes past the hour, right? Less introduction. So <laughs> th the idea is that, um, you know, you've got this this welling or swelling of of of, of, um, of tears in a face, right? Mm -hmm. And so, from a video creative standpoint, you should be able to well them up and just have the water just kind of like coming out of your eyeballs, right? You know, yeah. like couldn't you? Su can, I mean, look, I, I the challenge is actually a take it or leave it challenge because it might be too hard. It might it might be just um, and now I'm just playing with his ego. It might be too hard for him to do because you like to imagine like the water droplets moving and kind of like coming out. It's a very artistic um, challenge. It's going right? to need some CGI. Animation. Yeah, something or so, you know, yeah. you know so, some sort of like um, I know when I've been working on like motion graphics, um, you know, I don't have the big studio budgets, obviously, as you can tell. Otherwise, I would have rolled it out for you guys, right? <laughs> um, but, but the idea is, is that motion graphics is an art form to itself, right? So even if it's more like vector and kind of like tells the story, like it, it's still, um, it's more of the storytelling and the visual effect rather than the realism. Um but yeah, you know, like you can speed up time or, I mean, anyways, it's, it's, it's now I'm, I'm crossing the threshold and going into another artist's um, playground, but you know, that's the challenge to see how you could pool water, morph it and have it just. Kill them. Well, and, and the cool thing is, is that could be a really interesting connection moment between our two characters there, Adam, because like they won't cry the aliens because they show their emotion constantly right mm -hmm. the, it's happening through their their like chromatic skin colors so they like for the guy to cry in front of the alien it's that first epiphany of oh you do show emotion yeah right? it's a beautiful scene right it could be really oh it's like speaking their language for the first time <laughs> wow i also thought it would 
be really cool. I haven't gotten to this point yet, but you know, it's something like, why would something evolve to communicate in color? I'm like, well, because you communicate with light when you can't hear or it's dark. So I thought, what if on this planet you get these crazy storms that like block everything out and it gets crazy dark? And maybe they're lightning storms or whatever. So that to survive, they need to communicate with each other to warn each other or whatever. So we could have this super cool, intense storm scene. And I don't know, maybe the character does something somewhat heroic <laughs> in this scene, right? Maybe rec rec or rescues a child or something, something to earn him a place in the society of yeah. respect other than just like, okay, we saved you, right? And then, you know, then it's the classic um, story of going on like a vision quest, right? And eventually, maybe there's like a cliff he's got to climb or somewhere or some hallucinogens he's got to take, whatever it looks like. Um, Ayahuasca. You know, yeah, take something from Native American um, culture or stories or whatever and kind of mix it in there. That. that was kind of the sequence I was imagining in my head is, to really play with, I like the crying idea and kind of throw that in, but I think this is kind of the core of the heart of the, of the story, right? We've got to really, really put this person through a struggle and they got to come out the other side changed, right? different. Uh, so that was kind of what I imagined for like an act two. Oh, it's a lot funner when you're in act two. Like, don't see much set up. <laughs> oh, we could even go, so rabbit hole. Okay. We could even go down this whole thing where like the guy cries and they're like, oh yeah, this is like emotional thing. And then like later they're laughing and he starts to cry and then the, they get like really startled by it because it's the exact same response, but in a totally different scenario. And it mm -hmm. should have been another color. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck, man? You have one color. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that could be hilarious, right? Laughing, you know, maybe he's crying and then they dump water on their heads to try and, like, <laughs> um, Yeah. And then I thought maybe maybe at some point there's, like, a gift, some kind of crystal that glows different colors. Ooh. So they give him the ability to communicate in some fashion. Um, yeah, so he <laughs> can communicate his emotions. Ooh, interesting. Now, are they – he's going to have to teach this character – um his language at some point i say he i mean they right. we are gonna so we are gonna go through because i am super super not well practiced at gender neutral uh what is that pronouns so uh we're gonna have to go through and scrape everything and make the whole book gender neutral which is gonna be super hard hey we could get a, a guest on that, that that can help us do that you know there right. you go. Know, just uh you know att attention lgbtq community uh, right help us yeah be better. Plus xyz whatever i mean everything encompassing you know, yeah see I, if we can i was listening to some of those mastermind um classes and they do talk about like sensitivity um reviewers so for example if you're going to include specifically stories about i don't know this culture then somebody who knows about that culture will read it and be like, yeah, you got that right. That's not quite right. Or don't do that or whatever. Right. Like just to make, just to make sure if you're going to, I think we're in a sci-fi world. It's pretty broad. So I'm not too concerned about that. Yeah. Well, let me, um, let me throw something out to the group then. Um, I know, I think it was an early decision to keep it completely gender neutral. Right. Um, but as Kate brought that up and then you brought, and you linked that to the master class. Um, there might be like a, um, you, you, you can do a section of the book where it's talking about say a group of peoples or a population and it, and it speaks to that group. Um, you know, so that might, might be a way to kind of target a group in, in a way that is sensitive and, uh, minority driven and then engage the community in that way, rather than saying it's the whole book. Um, now the gender pronoun thing might be just different because I think we've already agreed upon having, you know, Quinn as a, you know, a gender neutral identity, um, yeah. individual, but, you know, in terms of other, um, aspects, you know, you might, you might want to, um, you know, think of creating certain populations or backstories or something to fill, you know, some of these audience niches, right? That's a cool idea. Well, and I think, um, 
you know, the gender neutral thing is, it's just our imagining of where the world is going in the future, right? It's not a statement on current events by any means, right? It's just, we're just saying the future. In our world. There you go. So, um, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. The one part I, I'm, I mean, we're kind of not there yet, but it's like at some point this character is going to want to leave the, this planet and go home. Right. And kind of have this vague notion that the two, I can't remember, Ratchet and Clanky funny characters are going to be somehow involved. The, one <laughs> the, part, the, the ship to begin with are somehow going to kind of show up again. And you know. they're going to show up again. I figured this out. Yeah. All right. They're going to show up again, but they're, uh, they won't show up until he's, he, Quinn is back on, on earth. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's going to find, find a friend outside of the village that helps run, I think, what are they mining? I think it's water. They're mining on this planet or something uh, that sends shipments back and forth. And the friend, they become friends. Maybe it's, Maybe that's like the the dad's. That's the kid that he saves. Hey, there, that works. There you go. Now he's indebted to him. He's going to sneak him on one of the cargo ships illegally. But he gets, he'll get, um, he has to sneak back in through the reach. I think we called it the reach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The um, dystopian outside of the the chipped in worlds on Earth. He's going to then. That's the second challenge. Get back in from the reach into his chipped in. Right. So that is what I was thinking. Yeah, I like that. And that was where he was going to see that in that culture, in the reach, they use um, technology to try and recreate um, brainwaves exactly. Right. So that I know what it feels like for you to have chocolate. I can experience it exactly, right? So this is, that's, that's exactly, so what we talked about, because we were experimenting with this one. Um, so what we talked about is that after he gets back in, so he's going to meet our, our two Wiley characters back in the Reach, right? And like, essentially try to kill them. Well, I mean, He's a he's he's not a threat. Let's be honest. Quinn is not a threat. But he's like, I can't believe you did that. And left me there to die. And then so they have this confrontation. And then uh, I think the way it'll work is like they'll be like, wait, wait, wait. We can that we can get you back in. We can ship you back in to the system. So like precariously, they're kind of like at the end of a gun. Yeah, we'll get you back in. We'll get you back in. But in doing that and like working together, they he talks about his experience and he ends up kind of befriending these little quirky guys, right? Um, and they decide how powerful it would be if you could share perception like the way they share emotion. Mm-hmm. So now you can share somebody else's experience and the way they felt. So they're now saying, okay, share the experience, share the emotion with me, understand me and come together. And so they actually run the tech in order to create it together. And that's the new company that Quinn starts. Oh. Does that make sense, uh, Adam? You, you're you're the partner. You should be nodding. <laughs> no, oh, we I haven't talked about this. Well, we did, we but we were about that. We're it's it's coming together, right? As we go further on, you know the you know the the part we're exploring in detail, and then there's the part you know three steps forward. <laughs> okay, where is this going? What is it going to go? How is it yeah. So, uh, yeah, like overall, that's kind of generally the arc we want to hit. And then we'll probably end it as in like, not all this is resolved. It would be a hopeful ending, but not a resolved ending. Um, so. Look, I want to, I want to say that it's um, it, just to give you a little bit of uh, perspective or depth on, on something, I want to bring up uh, BF Skinner and operant conditioning. This rings true, especially when you have a, a framing of emotion-only um, recording, right? If, if there's a way to transmit the, the emotion, okay? Now, um, 
I really like what Kate has said is about being able to um, almost like a film strip, put the, the experience and associate it with the, the experience, right? That's the missing context to um, a, a biochemical reaction. It, it, it absolutely is. And, you know, and I'm just, I'm playing as an outsider here coming into this thinking if, if you, if you have a fairly sterile um, environment, something that's pretty straightforward, um, A leads to B, which leads to C, which leads to D, then you can, you, you can um, see the causal chain. Okay. Of, um, of, of emotional trajectories or vectors. Right. But if you put any complexity into the system, the same emotional drivers and um, uh, biochemical uh, reactions that can happen in a very scared state can actually be one of joy and happiness. So if, if in the first little bit of the, of the sterile controlled environment, those emotional reactions are monitored and reacted to in um, in a very yin yang sort of way. Like if there's this emotion, we counter it with this. But as soon as complexity gets into the system, it's like, wait a minute, this is actually agitating it worse. This is causing a breakdown. And then the the unification of what Kate's talking about is that bringing perception into the emotional apparatus in one holistic um, program would be, um, I mean, ta-da, <laughs> right? Like that's, you know, like that, that's, that's the ha-ha moment, right? That might be part of what the, you know, the character is struggling or overcoming or finally achieving or not, or, you know, something like that, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I think, we, when we, let's take the business world, for example, right? When we are trying to get people to do something for us or we're trying to get something done, um, we can be very focused on what we're trying to do. And then other, especially in bigger companies, other people are more of an obstacle because they have, they're trying to do and it, it can be tricky to navigate, right? Mm -hmm. But what we miss, I think a lot of people miss, is that benefit of the doubt piece, right? <laughs> Where, where you give people the benefit of the doubt, you simplify people in your minds to, you know, you know that you're a complex disaster of emotion, but you look at other people and you're like, oh, they're just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> you collapse them into like a single notion or they're a bad person or they're, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the asshole who cut me off in traffic today. Right? Exactly. A person cut me off, they're a terrible person. You know, we, we so you could have that perception or it's like, well, this is how they feel when I do this. It would be um, very powerful, I think. Totally. Um, Adam's written a lot. Does he get to read? He does. Before we get on to that, I want to, I want to, I want to give you guys a, uh, a footnote, a, 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 a philosophical footnote, and this one's not to Plato. Oh. Oh, okay. 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 I can smell you from here, Kate. No, I just yeah, they, they, they probably smell like flowers. Um, so Nietzsche, he's yeah. a beautiful writer. Um, and maybe it's absolutely free. Go and pick up, uh, even if you have to just, you know, randomly go to three different places in that particular book. And I'm not a Nietzsche fan, but the gay science. Okay. And it has nothing to do with sexuality. Um, but it's um, very beautifully written in the form of aphorisms and small, condensed, interesting things. So um, the reason why I bring up Nietzsche is that he is um, kind of a pivot point in history, according to a lot of continental and Europe European philosophers, um, on, on, on the individual and on perspectivism. Okay, so one individual's perspective um, is um, uh, he very uniquely shaped that and articulated that with his particular genius. So um, 
yeah, if you guys if you guys want to dig into that uh, just a little bit to see if it grabs you at at any point, right? And I would ne- I know how busy uh, the two of you guys are, uh, the two of you are, and so I wouldn't unless you volunteered to do it to read the entire book. But it is freely available because it's well past any copyright. Um, it's freely available. You can download it from Gutenberg. Um, and what's you it, can, what's it called? 1882, again? the gay science, uh, 1882, it was published in. Yeah. And I, and I would say just, just to see if it speaks to you, right. pick three to 10 places to look at, like drop in like a parachute and go, what's going on here. Um, and with that context of, uh, the individual, and perspectivism. Think of those two heuristics as you as you read through his beautiful written. He's very, very, uh, a very ama- he's a he's an amazing writer. Very, um, very punctuated and and powerful. He's very he's very uh, he's a very good writer. So on that, um, then yeah, let's let's uh, maybe do a couple. Uh, readings if 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 you guys wanted to um pull up a a screen and and give us a little introduce us uh, a little bit about where we're at again and then uh and then go ahead adam do you want want to go sure uh let me find a good spot here it's not all interesting (laughs) um Of course, Kate, I have to, I mean, that was pretty good on the Google Oracle finger, fingers. You pulled that up really quickly, hey? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a need-to-know person. Did you know that, that like, I, I, I often call the Google, uh, the Google Oracle, right? Because it's like this modern tradition or this, like, modern equivalent of, like, going to the Oracle and saying, hey, Oracle, what, you know, what's in store for me? Or can you give me some wisdom or, you know, this type of thing? And it, uh, it, it's it's really interesting because Google takes, you know, that, that little prompt that you, when you start typing something, right, <clears throat> and the suggestions that come down, um, it's actually called something called a, an a priori algorithm. Yeah. And, uh, and and uh, prior to the senses, right? There's nothing about us that we can sense. Um, you know this, you know this this algorithm populating something now visually. We can go, oh yeah. Um, you know, if I type in spaceship, what is it? You know, you know what is it? What does it show me? And then I can kind of go on like a, a dendritic sort of like discovery of of what makes sense. But it's actually you kind of approach it thinking, oh yeah, I'm looking for something in particular, but I don't know exactly what, oh yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Right. (laughs) You know, like it's really fascinating. Have you ever ever watched Wreck-It, Wreck-It Ralph, Ralph Breaks the Internet? I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So (laughs) in one of the scenes, they walk up to the search engine, but it's a, like, it's Wreck-It Ralph. So it's a character. Right. Right. And so he's like, I'm looking for, and he's like, for this, for that, for this, for that. <laughs> he starts <laughs> rhyming off all the possibilities. It's really funny because it's literally as if somebody was reading all the list of Google. And as he's like saying more, he's like changing yeah. what he's saying. Oh, it's, I thought that scene was on point because it just made me laugh so much because it's absolutely ridiculous things that come up. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Great. Yeah. Sorry. Right. I just completely. Um, I thought it was funny. I actually, I, I, okay, Adam, I would go in just a second. I've had a, I've actually had this kind of a competition uh, with, I don't know, friends or family, whatever, like you have an idea and then you go to Google and you're like, damn, somebody's thought of that already. (laughs) (laughs) You know, right? Like, well, you have this amazing idea and you're like, well, let's just like, let's consult the Google or there and behold there, it's right there. (laughs) Before we go on this rabbit hole, it doesn't matter if somebody's thought about it already. Yes, if I know. You yeah. can market it better. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Adam, hit me. I'm excited because I haven't even peeked. Okay. Hang on, I need a snack. Oh. All right. So 
sidebar, if you want to watch a funny movie that's a commentary on technology, it's called Ron's Gone Wrong. It's hilarious. A, com- a commentary on what? On technology and like our obsession with it. And phones. Oh, okay. Ron's it's gone a wrong. kid's movie. It's it's well done. It's a cartoon. It's like it's a little. Everyone has this little robot that's their friend, and that robot follows you around, and it records everything, and it uploads to your social, and it like does all those things for you, and it interacts with people, and like likes stuff, and it's like it's like the physical version of social media, but it follows you around all the time. And all the kids have one at school and da da da. da. Then one of them, I can't remember, falls off a truck or something and he gets damaged. And this guy like can't connect to the internet. He's totally like off the hook. He's got a personality and he starts like, like just interacting with the world in very funny and amusing ways. Uh, but it's got a really nice point to it. Anyway, sidebar. That's a, that's a good movie. <laughs> Um, I share your love for chocolate and peanut butter cake. Right? Yeah. So good. Okay, I'm ready, Adam. Where's your popcorn, Daniel? Right? I'm just thinking about that that nice round peanut butter cup you got there. I'll share one with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I'll just pick a spot. So the character is woken up, you know, He's kind of interacted with this caretaker. And then I said, okay, it is then that I see my second member of this strange tribe. This one is tall and lean with sinewy muscles. It moves purposefully like a cat. Your caretaker turns and their eyes meet. A rapid flicker of color radiates from its skin, creating a swirling dance of color. The rainbow hues interlocking, intersecting. It is beautiful. In turn, the newcomer reflects its own dance of color, its skin nearly translucent with patterns of blue, green, and gold which turn to purples, reds, and oranges. After a moment, the newcomer seems to decide something and nods, satisfied before departing. Its gaze lingers on me for just a moment and its colors turn to a simple white, and then it is gone. I point to the flap in the tent. Who? I inquire. Again, my caretaker turns its head quizzically. My sounds are clearly confusing for it. If that is true, then perhaps sound is not the primary method of communication. But these thoughts are tiring and my sluggish brain fights for rest. And the last thing I see before I close my eyes and drift off are shades of purple and yellow. I awake sometime later. My caretaker is gone. There's a bowl of some delicious smelling soup. I sit up gingerly testing the waters. I'm not nauseous. This is good. With a grunt, I swing my legs over the side of the bed and again pause. For a moment, I feel lightheaded, but it slowly fades. I'm hungry. This is also good. With frantic enthusiasm, I down the brown liquid. It is delicious, and I don't even care that I don't know what it is. Just that the warm glow of my belly feels good. I can feel my strength returning. It is time to go outside. The first thing I notice is how white everything is. At first, I'm confused. Is this snow? But it's warm. But then a few scrapes of my bare feet bring me back to reality. The ground is covered in a fine white dust. It's soft like sand and not altogether unpleasant. Strange rock formations offer a focal point to the horizon. Towering columns of rock extend to the sky like fingers, and the warm glow of the sun across them makes the white dust sparkle and dance. It is quite striking. Normally, to someone who has spent most of their life in a space station, the endless sky of planetary living is overwhelming. Thankfully, my obsession with old Earth meant I spent much of my time crafting my sims in float and mimic this. Still, I can tell by my racing heartbeat that the real thing has a much greater effect. It's amazing how your perspective changes when your safety net is removed. I walked gingerly down a line of huts similar to the one I woke up in. They seem primitive in construction, yet effective. I can tell I'm swaying slightly and the pressure of an endless sky weighs heavily. My breath is becoming ragged and shallow, so when I see a rock to sit down on, I stagger towards it. I slump down on the rock and shut my eyes tightly, willing my world to shrink back down. Doors and walls, bulkheads and ceiling, doors and walls, bulkheads and ceiling. Slowly, I match the rhythm of my breath with the images of my home on the space station. In and out. In and out. Oh, that's great. My breath slowly slows and I gain some resemblance of control. Finally, after some unknown amount of time, I lift my eyes from my hands and peek them open. I'm greeted with a kaleidoscope of shifting color. Dozens of the creatures stand before me and around me. Their colors turn rapidly in stark contrast to the white neutrality of our surroundings. And it is simply too much for a mind that is just holding it together. My head hits the ground and the world goes dark, not before my analytical brain draws a connection between the churning colors and a crowd talking excitedly. There, that's a good place to stop. Ooh, the epiphany. I think it's hard to tell <clears throat> how the whole thing comes together. I can't I can't tell 
as as a as a reader kind of going on the whole journey of the and is it page turning is it page turning but i'm excited i think it it it, it sounds really good i like i like um i like how you're using descriptive really descriptive language um i think it's really good it starts filling my mind with this this image and you're playing with the words um in a cadence that um it's almost ninja-like. Good, congratulations. I think that's great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he is the ninja. There we go. You know, it's funny you should say cadence because sometimes I'll write and I'll, I'll write a bunch and I'll come back and read it later. And I'm like, no, it's too like, it, it starts and stops or like, it doesn't like flow. Like, like, like you said, if you're like a paintbrush, right? Yeah. Like, you know, like in your mind, it's filling in the, in the gaps and it's kind of moving along. So definitely... Definitely, I think, improving the more I do it, anyways. Well, there's a natural sort of thing. I mean, I know, like, I mean, I think maybe everybody has a different reason for why they write. And I I write uh, mm-hmm. to help me think. And it, I don't spend a lot of time writing fiction. I do spend a lot of time writing um, impenetrable uh, philosophy, which is hard to, <laughs> <laughs> hard to understand a lot of times, right? right? Yeah. Um, but... You know, there's a gentle, there's a love there for it. There's a love for the meaning and playing and twisting with words. Um, but uh, yours feels very um, like receptive and embracing of the tradition of good storytelling, right? Mixed with the genre of, of uh, and that goes for Kate as well. I think you guys are, you know, counterpointing nicely in this in this dance. So good job. I, I like what I'm hearing. Yeah. Well, I'm just glad that we we're seeing, pro, you know, progress. You know, we, we had a, like a, a goal of September for first draft. So still determined to hit that <laughs> do or die. So um, I know. And, and I remember Gaiman when he was talking about revising and mm-hmm. this is something that I've dreaded because I think for me, I'm like, I just have to get it finished. And then when I'm done, I don't want to look at it anymore. It's like, right. you know, I like get it out of here. God, I'm, just, I'm done with it. I, I did it. I'm, I want to. But what you know, the mentality of actually cutting and slashing and changing and rewriting and you know, um, what's going on here? Being hypercritical of yourself. I think that's uh, an important skill and one which we can transcend into the business world as well, right? Like. Um, professional uh world also you know in the family and in so many things to try and inwardly look at yourself and at your writing and how can i improve this and what is it saying and um you know that that type of thing right would you guys agree with that yeah i i really liked the notion of it's like i can't remember it was guy man or one of the other ones but he's like first draft no one sees the first draft but you then go fix it all, then show it to somebody. <laughs> but he has that professional, like, I know it's not right, and I'm going to fix and fix and fix. And then maybe as a new author, you don't know, am I fixing? Was it better to begin with? Was it, how am I, like, I think that's that's been the biggest challenge for me, not to be able to get the idea down, to be able to know what to cut, what to parse, how to uh, stitch it together in a way that, um, you know, doesn't, completely obliterate what you're trying to achieve right so that's that's going to be a challenge but i think you're right let's you know if you've got that you know first draft then you know that's um have you guys thought much about editors uh like line copy editors or or anything at that you know september october ish timeline no i just from what I, you know, the kind of advice I got listening to these other authors is, is just talking about, you know, building a relationship with, you know, a good editor. And then if you're trying to sell it later, like a good agent. But to say, like, I think Kimmer was like, an editor is, is often right, but not always. So when they tell you something, they're right, but they're not necessarily means you have to change it. <laughs> right. right. So you are ultimately the owner of the work. So if they tell you something, yeah, that makes sense that you do that, or they give an opinion, you don't have to. And I think that's important to remember. Um, so it seemed like an important lesson. 
What, and then wouldn't it make sense if we were, I mean, you know, the ideal situation, maybe not ideal, ideal, but you know, one approaching ideal situation would be to have an editor that has a, um, a background in science fiction work. Right. Would that be. I, I think so. Yeah. Like, um, Yeah, like absolutely. Does it does yeah. it make sense? Does it flow nicely? Or are you capturing? This doesn't have to be hard sci-fi, right? But, but does it? You know, will the audience accept what you're telling them? There's like certain little areas you can smudge over, and then you know the audience say, "Oh, okay, it's a black hole." They go through the black hole. They go back in time. Like that makes no sense, but I'm in, right? Whatever, you know. So, um. Yeah. And then I guess the last thing was when you're finally finished in this beautiful magical thing that you're so proud of, and then they're like, be prepared for like dozens and dozens of rejections before you get um, someone who's like willing to publish it. And it's not necessarily because it's a bad book. It's because they've already have 10 sci-fi, so they don't need another one. So don't take it personally. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's there's other things that can go with that. I mean, uh, uh, the the print on demand or the self publishing world is very very interesting right now with with distribution and um, you guys are no stranger to being in front of the camera, uh, you know, either as 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 soon to be authors, but also in many other you know capabilities. So. Um, there's, I think, a strong incentive to take it outside of traditional models and say, hey, how am I, what can I do with this, right? How can I, you know, get this out there? And, um, well, Kaylin, yeah, I think... Kaylin had some super fun ideas using NFTs. Oh, okay. Yeah. There, There's this, oh, you think I can remember the name of the platform? My NFT friends are going to laugh at me can't remember the name of the platform it's not open sea it's a different one but essentially it's meant for authors and you can essentially kind of create uh choose your own adventure and you can buy the next bit of the story the next bit the next bit they're not like super expensive you just then you can uh, map out your own story oh interesting oh it's very cool well um... You know, we thought, like, imagine if there's a part of the story that is not fully flushed out. It's just like, oh, that happened. If you want to know how, then, you know, purchase that NFT and you'll get that piece of the story. Or this, like, there, there's there's ways to create these, like, you know, you want to know the backstory around that character and how, you know, this crazy guy, like, what his deal is. And buy his NFT and you'll get the story. Like, things like that. Um Anyway, it's a creative space, I think, that has not been really uh, explored yet. It's like the Wild West. So it's like really anything goes. Well, you know, you guys have to, uh, I don't have to, have to, but I'd say about it, it's 75%. It makes sense to introduce the um, interactive video that I have. Right. So because it, it, the video is actually like a choose your own adventure. Right. So, you know, you set the scene, you set the stage, you say, OK, here's kind of the situation. Does Quinn go here or does or do they go here? Right. And, you know, we're, you know, the sponsor, you know, that's what I'm saying. And I'm using Quinn as an example because that's the, the main character in, in your mm -hmm. guys's book. But um, it was the first to my I, I absolutely love this idea of having that interactive video because, you um, it's not available on a, 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 you know, a typical Vimeo or YouTube or any of that kind of thing to be able to say, oh, here's the trajectory I want to kind of weave down. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's completely doable, uh, you know, with with certain other alternative technologies. Right. And they're very, very cool to use. Yeah, I think we can have some fun with that. Um, yeah. I've always loved the idea of choose your own adventure. Kaylin and I did one uh using click funnels uh around business and it was like this happened what do you want to do do you want to lay people off do you want to look for alternative solutions do you want to and then whatever you clicked would go to like the next stage like, all right this happened do you want to do this do you want to do this and this 
And then at each scenario along the side, we like, did you know Enta helps with this, blah, blah, blah. So it was like, you know, a marketing brainstorm was fun to build. Um, you know, it went nowhere, but it was uh, actually one, one, one guy got really offended because we were talking about layoffs and he just happened to be going through layoffs and he did not see the humor in using it in a thought experiment like that. Fair. And it wasn't necessarily humorous. It's real. Like these, and I said to him, like, I'm sorry you're going through this. This is actually based on real scenarios that we've come across with our clients. This is, we want to prevent that. We want to give people options and have them understand what they are. So yeah, it was, it was yeah. interesting. He got really angry. He apologized after that. But yeah, it's tough for certain people, right? I mean, everybody, maybe everybody's got a battle. Just what, you know, what is it we're battling? So anyways, mm -hmm. um, Kate, we've got 10 minutes left. What's, uh, where's your mind space at in terms of, uh, the book, what, what Adam read, um, you can talk about NFTs. You can talk about choose your own adventure. You can talk about where your creative, you know, next move is in terms of um, uh, authorship. So okay, so I think um, I'm going to let Adam play in in the tribe to go through on the emotional journey that he so, does so well. Continue the character, and I'm going to jump ahead to when he gets back to Earth and meets our two characters and get them back in to it. Those little cheeky sort of pyro pirates, space pirates. That he, and I'll, I'll write that scene and then Adam can catch up to me again like he does. And then, yeah, we'll fill in the blanks and we'll be super close after that. Like it's, it's crazy, it's coming along. Cool, so, and that's, that's where, where Quinn integrates into the system again, right? Just before. This will be like his experience in the reach. Yeah. Okay. Outsiders. Right? Yeah, outsiders. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, that'll that'll be interesting to kind of this is like a group you've your whole life looked down upon and now are reevaluating what you've been told. Right. right. No. Especially with this new lens that he's acquired. Yeah. Right? He's acquired this emotional intelligence, this lens, this understanding of connection and and yeah, people. So it's going to be really interesting to have him see the reach now through this lens, not the lens that the government wants him to see it through. Ooh, there's a lot there. Hey, <laughs> that. oh, we, we only have 10 minutes. So let's not unpack that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Emphasizing on the government or whether like, what is the control is the controlling entity, the overarching thing. Is it, is it the government? Is it the, is it the corporation? Is it? Uh, I think we had it as the, like, there's a conglomerate of intelligent planets that have come together under a single rule. But I think there, there's worth exploring there, right? Like, right now, we talk about platforms, social media, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, on and on and on. But they own the content you put on there, which means they can kick you off whenever they want. And, Doc increments for this, right? Just taking you off. So, um, you know, now we're moving to more of a world where you own your country, you put whatever the hell you want out there. The question then is, how do you police it? How do you stop people from putting out like hate messages or terrible things or whatever? Um, so, is it a complete free for all, or does like some kind of like self governing system exist? Or is it like, yeah, you can put out whatever you want, but is it controlled in a different way, like over here? I think there's always control. So I think that's kind of a neat place to ponder. It's like, well, where does the control shift to? If it's not here right in front of your face, it's somewhere else. Don't pretend like it's not. So where's it going to be? I don't know the answer to that. Well, even... Um even there's a concept of a Leviathan, a self or, you know, if you talk about complex systems, you can talk mm -hmm. about a, um, a force that kind of self-regulates. Okay. So the wild West has been uh, attributed to that. Uh, pirates have been attributed to these. Then I'll give you the kind of the breakdown of both of those. So in the wild West, you could have, well, it was manly to do this. We had this unwritten rule of, you know, this is what you did. You know, there's an agreement, you know, you kind of, we just knew that's how you did the things, right? 
Uh, pirate uh, scenarios, you know, very similar, right? And so there's like an emergent group phenomenon that happens where you somewhat regulate yourself, but mm-hmm. it's an emergent property. It's not, it's not a handed down to you property from some from somewhere else, right? And um, you know that would that would be interesting to play with, right? Like ha- how entities actually self uh, self regulate. Well, this right because there's... this is coming down. This is going to happen like sooner than later because we're getting all this DeFi decentralized finance happening, and you're getting entire virtual communities who are self governing. And they actually own land. And now they're creating like whole governance models on what to do with the land and what to do with that. Like it's, we are going to reinvent what it is to self-govern and it's going to happen sooner than later, I think. I wonder if the the answer would lie in access, right? So it's like, yeah, you own your content, you can put out there whatever you want, but if you want access to these networks or those networks and these networks, they've all set like certain parameters so if you're not following them, your stuff won't make it in, right? Or they, yeah, but then that defeats the point of. Uh, um, Same thing is what we've got now. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting, Adam, because <laughs> it's a super valid point. Like there's um, the the free version, the like free speech version of YouTube, which is Odyssey, right? It's like YouTube's own free speech video version. I don't know if you know about it, Dan, but in fact, you can like, sync your two so youtube will automatically upload to odyssey odyssey's free speech like they won't take it down monetization of your videos becomes yours that's what it's all about yeah so it's it's really interesting because then at what point do you like say hey like there's things that are like morally wrong who gets to say Great With question. five minutes left, I don't know. You guys want to rock, paper, scissors on that one? <laughs> okay. One, two, three. All right. I got smashed. I feel kind of like yeah, it's it's a, it's something Adam. on that. We got two rocks there, didn't we? Or right. Adam got it. Okay. So you have to tell us, you know, what the what the control of this experiment is. What what morality do we need to listen to? <laughs> in, in four minutes Adam go <laughs> oh, man, that is, I have the slightest clue that's a tough one okay well, let me say hate speech oh. incites oh. violence right these are usually the low bar right this is the stuff that says hey wait a minute you know no no killing dogs no mutilating animals no don't do anything you wouldn't be willing to admit to your mom <laughs> there we go. Okay, yeah. All right. If you have a good relationship with your mom, that's probably a great parameter. Right? Yeah. So go to Zinni, I suppose. So so actually, you know what, Adam, you kind of got a good name for that. So don't do anything that Adam wouldn't do to his mom. Right. <laughs> because it's almost biblical, Adam, you know, this type of thing, right? And it's like an origin story in itself. And so it's it like, Everybody who can was kinda, Adam's mom is the question. Who was Adam's mom? Was it the Gaia like <laughs> hypothesis or what was it? Okay. Tune in next week, guys. Yeah. Find out. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. You bet. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions.